basically what we're doing this, this, uh, in this series, um, The Father's House, is we're trying to understand exactly what God wants from us when we assemble. What does he want when we get here? What does he want us to do? How's this, how does this work? And I think sometimes what happens is we get, we've been in church at some times, all, all of us have a different, you know, we come to this place for, maybe from different traditions and backgrounds and experiences. And then what happens is we sometimes think that, you know, it's kind of up to us what we want to do when we get here and we could do this or we could do that. But I think we, had, we have to understand that the scripture gives us some directives of what this gathering's about and what we want to do. And um, so this morning we're going to find out some things. We're going to learn some things about this as we, uh, as we look into this series and we start off our first, uh, our first uh, leg of this, uh, of this series, Our Father's House. In the book of, of Luke, chapter 14, there's a story that Jesus tells. And it's a poignant story in that he is in the setting in which he's going to tell the story. And it's the story about the man that had this big banquet. He went out and invited people to come to it. Some people excused themselves from it. So he said, let's go, let's go get the rest of them. So now we're, we're going to talk about that. But before we talk about that, let me explain this to you. Jesus was at a banquet when he was telling this banquet story. You talk about awkward. <laughs> He was there with that, some of the Pharisees. Uh, Pharisee had invited him to his house for one of those banquets. And as he's there, we, he come to find out that he ne wasn't necessarily a guest, but he was kind of a project. Because they invited him there so they could watch him. They invited him there so they could find him doing something wrong or saying something wrong so they could make a big deal about it. And so what Jesus did is he took this opportunity to kind of you know, uh, adjust their ideas and bring them to an understanding of what really matters. So with that said, let's look at the text and come to understand what Jesus is talking about when he tells this great story. He says, a certain man was prepared a great banquet and invited many guests. And at this time, the banquet, the, uh, um, at the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But um, they all alike began to make excuse. First, the first said, I have bought a field and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I am on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I got married so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. So here's what I want to tell you about this story. Um, Jesus uses this story and he, he exaggerates a lot of things in this story because he's wanting to press home a certain point. He's wanting to make a certain point. He kind of, he's kind of baiting them into this story because he wants them to experience it. Not only with just hearing what they're saying, hear what he's saying, but feeling what he's saying. And so in this context, what he does is he tells them about a, a man that makes a big banquet. Now, I got to tell you something about tradition of the first century. In the first century, for someone to, to prepare a big banquet was a big deal. It was no small matter. And there was a lot of expense that went into it. There was a lot of preparation that went into it. And it wasn't just about the meal. The meal was very important. But it was about the whole structure of how this thing was uh, coming about and how important it was. And then let me tell you this. When these people were invited, it's not like they got the, all the information with the invite. They got the invitation and they said, hey, we're going to have a banquet and we want you to come. And they said, okay, we'll come. And then what happened was, as the banquet was developed and all the preparations were made, then they got notification, okay, come now. And what you were expected to do was adjust your life in that moment and whatever you were doing, adjust your life, adjust your schedule, and go. Go. And so what's happened is, these people have already been invited. This is not a surprise to them. 
Now the banquet's made. Now that all the preparations have been made. And now he's sending his servants out to say, okay, everything's ready. Come now. And the Bible tells us about these people who excuse themselves out of the, the banquet. Now, I just got to tell you <laughs> that as he's telling this story and, and putting the details to it, he's taking us to a certain place that he wants us to see it. And so the information that he's given to us in this thing is really absurd. I think what happens with this is that he's trying to get them to understand and he's trying to get them to build this to the, to the end of it and all the details because here's what I'm going to tell you. In the first century, if you were invited to a banquet and they said, okay, now the banquet's ready, come. And you said, no, I'm not able to come. You would be committing social suicide. You would not do that in that land. You would not do that in that culture. That would not be acceptable whatsoever. Folks, I got to tell you, and Jesus addresses it a lot in the New Testament. The social structure of the New Testament and the people of that culture was extremely important and very manipulative and very tight. And so what's going to happen is this. If you forego some, some invitation that you've received to come to a banquet like this, come to an event like this, and then you don't come, I will tell you what list you will come, <laughs> you will wind up on. You will wind up in the ostracize them list. You will, lie, you will wind up in the, you know, uh, when they see you out in public and you say, hey, you're not going to get a hey back. And I want you to understand something. This is something that Jesus addressed with that whole social structure. Remember the, the, the man in John chapter 9? He was born blind. Jesus told him, he put clay on his eyes. He told him, go wash your eyes in the pool, uh, in the, in, in the pool called Scent, Siloam. And so as he put the, he, he's, he's filling around, he finally goes, washes his eyes, and he comes back seen. And, the, the, and the, all the religious people said, what happened to you? He said, I don't know. I, 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 this man told me to do this, and, that, and I did it. Now I can see. They said, who was he? I don't know. I, can't, I couldn't see then. I could see now. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Duh. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, they're asking him all these questions. He's trying to respond to them, but he's like, going, you know, that guy's work with me here. You know, I was blind. Who was he? I don't know who he was. I didn't see him. So what they did was they called his parents, and they said, is this your son? They said, yes, it is. They said, was he born blind? Yes, he was. How does he now see? We don't know. And the Bible says that they were afraid to give him the wrong answer because they know if they didn't, they didn't give them the right answer, the Bible says they'd be put out of the temple. What does that mean? That's that social structure. That's that little political thing. And so, folks, this was, this was rampant in the New Testament. And so when Jesus is telling this story, he said, okay, I'll tell you a story. There's a guy made a big banquet, and there's a bunch of people that were invited. When the banquet became ready, these people bailed on him. And everybody's sitting there going, oh, no. Though, oh, that's, you know, that would never happen. But that's how he told it. Now, I want to tell you something about the excuses. Jesus hides something in these excuses. And we always look at these excuses. I've heard, pre I've heard preachers preach on these excuses and dissect them and, and do everything with them, he won't, you know, you can imagine. And really, none of that applies. But I'll tell you what does apply. One of them said, I've purchased some land, and i got to go see it. The other one said, I've purchased five yoke of oxen, and i got to go try them. Do you know who these people were? Wealthy people. Wealthy people, folks. Because in the first century, you couldn't buy land. And if you did buy land, it was a big deal. Remember the story Jesus told in, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 13? When he told the story about the guy that went out and found this treasure, 
and he found the treasure and he moved it and hid it away. And then he went and he sold everything he had and bought the land that the treasure was on. Why did he have to sell everything he had? Because the land was expensive. And then the Bible says that this guy bought not one, not two, five yoke of oxen. That's expensive. So who, did, who got invited to this thing? Wealthy people. You say, Pastor, can you explain the one about the guy who said he got married? <laughs> I can but I'm not gonna. <laughs> no, there's, that's a mystery even. I, I, you know, that's a, there's a lot there to that, but uh, maybe that's the big expense too. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I, maybe for him. But anyway, in, 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 this whole, in this whole story that Jesus is telling here, he's connecting to them in their culture. He's connecting to them with their experience, but he is absolutely just, you know, making their minds explode right now. They go, oh, no, nobody would do that. And the Bible says that the story goes on to say that was the first wave of people who were invited, and they didn't come. And so when they came back to the, Jesus continues the story, when they came back to the master and said, hey, listen, these guys have begged out. And the Bible says that the master was very angry. And he said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out among the poor people. I want you to go out among the diseased. He goes on to say, um, he goes on to say, the servant came back and reported to his master. Uh, the owner of the, of the house became very angry and ordered his, his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the towns and bring in the poor, the cripple, the blind, and the lame. And they did. Now, folks, here's another mind blower. Because I want you to understand, if somebody had a big banquet, that's not who would get invited. Let me tell you how severe this is. In that culture, if you had a big banquet and invited those people, they wouldn't come. You know why? Because they would feel like, we don't, that's not us. We can't do that. That's not for us. So Jesus tells him. Now, here's the thing I want you to think about this. He told him to go out and get poor people. Gotcha. And then he starts talking about, he starts talking about other categories that creates a lot of um, interesting logistics. Okay? So he said, go out and get poor people. Okay, great. And then he gets to get crippled people. Okay, well, they're going to need help getting there. Lame people, probably going to need some help getting there. And then he said, blind folks. Yeah. Don't tell them to Google. It's not going to help them. You know, you got to get them there. So now this is going to require a lot of effort. And so the Bible says, he goes on with the story, and we see that this, this, is, a, this is an absolute taboo. This is not a setting where these people are going to come to. They're not, this, this is not how it works. You don't invite people that need you to your banquet. You invite people to your banquet that you need. How sad is that? Folks, let me tell you what we do. We do it, and, and, and we all build a network of people in our life where we help them, they help us, and you, you know, and you know how it is back and forth. Nothing wrong with that. But unfortunately, we never get to the next tier to traffic with the people who need us, but they can't help us. And can I tell you that, that we should have a coalition of people in our life that when we go help them, we're helping them because we're helping them, not because they're going to be able to help us. Right? And so this is, this is the story. And so now these people are listening to this story go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're going to invite those people? Why would you have a big banquet for those people? They can't help you. 
I mean, they would say it unashamedly. They'd say it unabashedly. They would just say, this is, this was, this is silly. Why would you have a big, make a big deal over people that can't help you, can't advance you socially? And then they invited those people. And then there's a third wave of invitations that go out. And the third wave... He said, he came back to me and said, Lord, we've done what you told us to do. And now he said, we're, we're, the, the house is still not full. We still got room. He said, okay. He said, I want you to go out to the roads and, 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 um, and country lanes and compel them to come in. And why? So my house will be full. Full house. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. So now here's what's interesting. <laughs> he goes from inviting the, 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 the invited and going to say, okay, well, you were invited and now I'm telling you that the meal is ready, so come. And they begged out. They said, no, can't go. And then he said, okay, I want you to go get these people who, who, you know, these lame people, poor people, get them here and let's just bring them in. Now, they're going to need help. They're going to have to be brought in. And so he said, we, okay, they did that. And then he tells them to go out and the second way, the, th the third wave, and to anywhere you could go, and he, said, he uses this word, compel them. You know, invitation is, hey, would you like to come? to this banquet compel is hey you come here <laughs> you're coming with me <laughs> and, the, and he strongly urged them you know the word compel is just that but just that far away from force them <laughs> and he went out and got them and the whole thing that he's talking about here, folks, is he's just kind of blown up the whole traditions. He's kind of blown their mind with all the, all the things he's told them so far about his story, but he's brought it down to the one thing. There's the one thing that the person who gave the banquet was interested in, and that was this, a full house. A full house. And so... I want to do this. I want to start this, this theme with us. I want that to be part of our culture. I want that to be part of our goal setting system. I want you and I to think about, pray about, and consider making that the goal for our church. Because what I understand from scripture is that honors God. That honors God. If he's given to us a facility, let's fill it up for him. And see what he does after that. And so, I'm going to get to that in just a moment. So, so what we see in this story is that he's telling all of this stuff that these people are going, that would never happen. No, that would never happen. Well, that would never happen. And then he gets down to the bottom and he says, well, here's the thing. The, the, the whole, this whole effort, this whole story I'm telling you is because... The, the, the man that gave the banquet wants a full house. So what do we know about that? God wants us to fill the house. Okay? So, with this story told, with all of these things understood, and now we see it from a biblical perspective, we understand it within its context, we understand it within its traditional context. We, if we were among that crowd sitting there listening to the story, we would have the same perspective that they have, that we now have that perspective now. He's told the story, and what we know is he told this exaggerated story for one reason. He wanted to get them to understand that God wants a full house. Now let me give you four takeaways from this passage of scripture. Okay, you ready? Number one, God will never waste his grace. He'll never waste it. The Bible says that he came to his own in John chapter one. His own didn't receive him but as many as received him, he gave them the power to become sons of God. 
Okay, now watch this. He came to his own, his own people, the Jewish people, and they rejected him. So did he just go back to heaven and say, okay, well, you don't want it, you don't want it, that's fine. No, he didn't do that. He expanded his grace to those who did receive him. And friends, here's what I want you to understand about that. We have two audiences. We have people among us and all around us that fall into one category or another. They're, gonna, they're either going to be interested or they're not going to be interested. They either want to receive him or they don't want to receive him. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you about those people. Some of those people that don't want to receive him, sometimes those people wind up over here in the, in this, in the crowd that do want to receive him. Because things change for them. And isn't it interesting how things can change in our lives? Do you remember what Jesus said when he stood there in those puddles of water on the, on the, uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles? You remember what he said? On the final day of the Feast of Tabernacles, they poured out water from cylinders. The priest did. They poured out this water from these cylinders, and the water came cascading down the steps of the temple, and all the people stood there in silence and watched this because that was to simulate the water that God provided for the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness. And as they just stood there in silence, and everyone just stood there in reverence and watched this happen, it was then that Jesus stepped up. And stood in one of those puddles, and this is what he said. If anyone here is thirsty, I am the water of life. Why didn't he just say, hey, everybody, I'm the water of life. Because you got to be thirsty. And folks, I'm getting back over here. I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay in the middle. I'm going to stay off those edges. Life will make you thirsty. You know, it's interesting how when we walk through our lives and, and, we, and, and we say, well, you know, it's, and, and we have people tell us, <clears throat> well, that's just not something I'm interested in. I'm not interested in religion. I'm not interested in God. And they get one diagnosis and all of a sudden, yeah. Oh, we're the same way, folks. Even the believers. We can get complacent. <clears throat> and we can get careless. And then, boy, I tell you what, let the, let the finances back up. And we're going, God! Right? God never wastes his grace, folks. It's available for those who want it. Right? And it's always available for those who need it. You say, well, this story Jesus tells is an extravagant story. Yeah, but did you hear the story? He went out and made his first invitation. Those people didn't take it. He said, okay, you don't want it? I'll get more people. I'll get different people. I'll reach in another direction. He came to his own. Those people didn't receive it, but there were many that did receive it. And folks, I'm one of them. You're one of them. And thank God he had enough grace to go around to everybody. So I think it's important that we see that. It's important we understand that. Paul said, <clears throat> Paul said that um, I, am, I am what I am by the grace of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. And then he said this. He said, and the grace of God was not wasted on me. So let that be our prayer. Let that be our goal. Let that be our resolve. God poured out his grace on us, and let's not let that grace be wasted on us. And so what we understand about this is, first of all, God, God did not waste his grace. Um, and as well, God is not impressed with social structures. He really is not affected by that. Now, the Bible tells us in... in um, 
in the book of Galatians, chapter number three, verse number 28, that God's not affected by, he has no favorites. We're all his favorites. As a matter of fact, he does, God doesn't have favorites. He has favor. And he pours out his favor on everybody. And when you look at the people that God used, you look at the people, you look at the 12 disciples, friends. I mean, you know, what a bunch of rednecks. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, these guys were not the ones that I would have picked. You say, hey, listen, Jesus is coming to earth. He's going to redeem mankind. He needs 12 people to help him. Would you, you know, can we, you want to do some, help us do some interviews? You know? Sure, I'll help you. Peter walks in and goes, well, what's this all about? And I think I should be in charge. Okay. Um, you can step to the back of the line, sir. You know. Thomas comes in and says, I don't know if this is really what I want to do or not. This is kind of weird. And then, I mean, you know, I'm going to have to follow this guy around. I don't know. You know, do you, well, would you like this position? I don't know if I want it or not. Okay. Call us when you figure it out. Thank you. Have a nice day. I mean, just go down the line. He didn't pick anybody out of society, did he? Tells me there's a place for me. Maybe that tells you there's a place for you. He's not interested in those social structures. He's not interested in all of those kinds of things because the, the, the opportunity that he gives to us is that he takes and empowers us to do what he wants us to do. We don't have the power and the ability. We need it from him to be able to serve him. Folks, listen, we can't even serve him without him. We can't even worship him without him. He's not impressed with the social structures. That's number two. Number three, God will call normal people to accomplish his purpose. God will just get the regular people. Now, you may not see yourself as regular. You may see yourself as irregular or however you see yourself. But God can use us the way we are. I'm reading a book. I shared this book with a, a small group that we're starting. I shared this group. It's a great book. It's called The Me I Want to Be by John Ortberg. And what he talks about in that book is this. When we think about doing a personal renovation, when we think about doing a, you know, a, a change in our lives, we sometimes want to be somebody else. And what he's telling us is this. In the book, he tells us how God created us. We believe that, but we have to go all the way with it. God created you not just physically, but he created you emotionally. He wired you the way you are, and he wants you to be you, but he wants you to be the best you that you can be for him. And we see other people and how God uses them, and we sometimes want to emulate them. But what we want to do is we want to be, just be inspired by them to be not them, but to be us. But we do the best us we can be. And so what we know is this. <clears throat> God is not going to waste his grace. If people turn it down, there's, all, there's plenty of grace for those that were, will accept it. God is um, not impressed with the social structures. He's not involved in that. He doesn't sponsor that. That's not him. The third thing is, God wants... God, God, God will call and enable real people, regular people, to do, to accomplish his purpose. And this is my final, my final point. This is what I, I really want to hone in on for just a moment here. God wants his house full. He's given to us a facility. He wants us to fill it. So we're going to talk about that for just a minute. What does that mean? How do we do that? So here's, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give us a to-do list for how to get God's house full. Ready? Three easy things. Number one. Come to church. Come to church. Now folks, I want you to hear this, what I'm going to tell you with your heart, okay? I don't want 
to sound like, and nor do I want to install anything in our church that sounds rigid or legalistic or anything like that. I want to tell you this before I tell you any other thing. Your church days affect your other days. Try that again. Your church days enhance your other days. And the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 2, verse number 1, the Bible says that we need to maintain a connection with the truth and what we've been taught. Watch this. Because if we don't maintain a connection with the truth and what we've been taught, he said, we will drift. And I love that word. I love the word drift. Because when you drift, you do it unintentionally. When you drift, you do it unknowingly, right? I remember when we were kids, we, the, big, the big thing for us was we'd go to the beach. And we'd go out to the beach, and, you know, and, and, uh, and we'd set up everything out there, as towels, and, and we'd get everything all set up, our little place there on the beach, and then we'd go in the water. And we stayed in the water all the time. And we're jumping the waves, and we're doing the boogie board, and we're, you know playing shark, whatever, we're doing whatever. And we stay out there for, you know, 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half. And we look around and say, okay, let, let's go in. And we look up where we're standing and somebody stole our towel. <laughs> What's the deal? And as we look up there, we don't even recognize those people that are up there that we're looking at. And you know why? Because we drift. And our stuff is way back there. It's way back there. We got to get out of the water and go walk back there now. But we didn't know that. And sometimes, folks, what happens is when we don't keep a routine, we don't keep a pattern of worship and a and a, and a pattern of, of the word and a pattern of fellowship and a pattern of the things that we enjoy when we come here, we don't keep those things. We unknowingly drift. We drift. So here's what I'm, here's what I'm not saying. You say, Pastor, you tell us we can't you know, go out of town for a week? No, I'm not saying that. You know why I'm not saying that? I'm not going to get upset when you go out of town for a weekend because I don't want you to get upset when I go out of town for a weekend. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is sometimes, folks, there's those days, those Sundays, when we let things distract us from church. You know what I'm talking about. I want you to, I want us to make it that priority. Because I want to tell you something. The first contribution that I get to make to a full house is me. So I get my happy little self up. And I skittle on over here. And you know what's, you know what's amazing? This is, this is crazy. This sounds so silly to say it. But have you ever found yourself in one of those quandaries and you're looking around on a Sunday and you're going, oh, no, I, yeah, I should, but I don't know. And, uh, and then good wins out and you go. And then when it was all over with, you look around and go, man, I'm so glad I went. I'm so glad. Folks, here's what I'm going to tell you. I ain't, nobody's, nobody's going to beat you up if you don't. But I just want to encourage you to, to, to know that our being here is a ministry to us. But listen to me. Your being here is a ministry to the people that are here. Let me just, I want you to understand something. When you show up and you come in this door and you cast your lot with me, you bless me. You help me. I see you here, I'm here, and I see you here. This is great. This is great. We need to prioritize this. We need to say, you know what? 
This is going to happen. Am I going to go away for a weekend or so? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, you know, we're going to, well, yeah, that, that, of course. But you know what? I'm going to make it my priority that my first contribution is going to be me. And I'm going to be there as much as I can. I'm not going to be distracted. I'm not going to be pulled out. I'm not going to be pulled away. I'm going to be there. Because my God wants his house full, and I'm going to do my part for that. Show up. Number two. Here's what else we could do to contribute to a full house, God's house full. Uh, number two, invite. Matter of fact, invite, 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 invite everybody, and invite all the time, and invite, and invite, and invite. Remember those two groups of people I told you about? Jesus sent his disciples out and he said, listen, I'm going to send you out, but I'm going to tell you something. When you go out, there's some people who's not going to receive you. If they don't receive you, stand on their doorstep and argue with them and debate them and ridicule them. No, that's not what he said. That's not what he said. That's not what he said. Some of you guys are getting excited about that. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. Woo, I can't wait. It's not what he said. He said, they don't receive you. Leave. Leave? Yeah. We sure? Why should I? Pastor, don't you think I? Folks, listen to me. Listen to me. He said, there's people out there that won't listen to you. And if they won't listen to you, don't spend your time with them. I was... Um, I got to cover this one real good. I was talking to someone a long time ago in a faraway land, and they were talking about a problem they were having with their grown child. And they said, you know, I don't know what the deal is. I tell them, I tell them, I tell them, I tell them, and they just don't listen to me. I said, you're going to tell them? Yeah, I'm going to tell them some more. I said, okay, well, do this. Stop. Stop. What you're telling them and how you're telling them and why you're telling them is not working Stop. Tell it to somebody that wants to listen to you. And that's what Jesus said. You go to somebody, they refuse it. Go from them. And when you go to somebody and they receive it, stay with them. Here's what I want to tell you about invitations. You say, well, pastor, I've invited people in the past and they didn't come. So everybody's done that. Let me tell you what, 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 what's going to happen. <laughs> When you give, the, give an invitation to the right person at the right time, yeah, thanks. <laughs> She's waving me off the trap door over there. <laughs> at 11.30, this whole thing collapses, so don't worry about it. If you give the invitation to the right person at the right time, I promise you, guarantee you 100%, they're going to come. You say, well, pastor, how do I know who the right person is? You don't. That's why you invite everybody. Invite everybody. You say, well, if I invite them, they won't come. You don't know that. And then when you invite the right person at the right time, and we talk, just talked about that, seasons of life changes everything. Folks, there's times people are thirsty. Oh, they're thirsty. And life will make you thirsty. And through this COVID thing, people have been extremely frightened and, and a lot of fear and all these other kind of things. And when you can invite them to join us in, in person, join us online. I don't want to go out and crash. Join us online. Folks, I want to tell you something. Our online ministry is, is outstanding and it's growing. We're hearing from people across. It, um, I uh, heard from somebody uh, recently from New Mexico. I, I listen to you online. <laughs> you know? It's, it's amazing. So what I'm telling you is this. The invite is continual. It's to everybody. It's always. And it has to come out of our mouths. And I'm going to tell you what you're going to have in about two weeks from now. We're going to have 5,000 invitation cards printed from our church. And on these cards is going to tell them how to get here. It's going to tell them what type of service is, going to tell them where, it's going to tell them everything. 
And you could walk up to someone and say, I'd like to invite you to my church and hand them that. And folks, we need to do that. That's our job. We need to invite everybody. And you say, well, Pastor, what if they don't come? Just keep inviting. Because you're going to walk up to the right person at the right time and the right season of their life, and they're going to come. They're going to come. And then the final thing I want to share with you is this is one way to fill the house. We want to show up. Second way, invite. Third way, we want to pray. Let me, just, let me just tell you how that works. We want to pray specifically for the presence of God to meet with us and to be in our presence when we're here. Folks, let me tell you something. That is absolutely the difference maker. If we gather here and we do so in a social structure, we have nothing. If we gather here for the purpose of trying to impress one another and, and you know, and try to build some kind of status where I'm better than you and you're, and you're down here and I'm up there. We do that. We play that game, folks. We're wasting our time. But when we gather here in the presence of God, that power of his presence melts our hearts, changes us and transforms us. It's the power of God's presence among us. And so what we need to do and what we have been doing is we've got leaders moving through our, through our uh, building here, praying over the building and praying over the seats and praying over the, the, the music ministry and the, and the back tables, praying, praying, praying. And I want, you to, I want you to join us. I want you to join us. I want you to put us on your schedule. Come on in here about 10 o'clock on Sundays. And just come and let's pray together. Let's just pray God's presence into this place. I'm telling you, it's the difference maker. We have folks that visit with us and we have opportunities for them to, to register their visit with us. And we appreciate that. And those that you're here with us this morning, we hope you'll do that. We have a, a gift back there for you. And, and many of them will leave a comment. And you know what the number one comment is that we've heard in the last four weeks? I experienced the presence of God. That's it. You know what that is, folks? That's a ringer. That's a bullseye. That's what we want. That's what we want. So here's what I would say. To fill God's house, let's be here. Let's resolve in our heart. You're gonna, you know what? On those... Teeter-totter Sundays, it's not going to be teeter-totter anymore. I'm going. I'm going. Not going to be distracted, I, you know. Let's be here. Let's invite others here. You know what? This place can do for the people that you care about more than what you can do. This place, because of the presence of God, and they'll be exposed to the word of God, they'll be exposed to the worship of God, I'm going, to walk, I'm going to tell you something. All the people in my life that, I'm, that, I'm, that I care about, that I want to minister to, I can't do that for them in a conversation. But if I bring them here, I can allow them to experience that and see their life changed. And then pray. Pray for the power of God. Pray that God ministers to and invades everybody's heart as we gather. And folks, the greatest thing that I can hear anybody say is I, I went to Dunham Community Church and I experienced the presence of God. That's the greatest thing that could happen. The Father's house. It's full house. So let's resolve today that that's what we're going to do. Let's resolve today that we're moving forward toward that uh, the back to church Sunday in September the 20th, and we're going to get the house full before we even get there. And that is be our offering to the Lord. One of them is our contribution to God's house being full. Father God, I thank you for your word. 
I ask you, God, that you would just allow us, Lord, to be a part of that purpose. I pray, Father, that our resolve to be faithful worshipers of yours and, uh, would be uh, something that we could all experience. I pray, Father, that we would be um, conscientious to make invitations to people, to invite them here to this place where they could experience you, God, in their life. And then, Lord, I pray that as we come, as we gather others, that we would be careful to come before you and ask you, God, and beg you for your presence among us, that you could do your great work in the hearts of your people. And we thank you. And we praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen.